My message this morning is entitled, Discerning the Last Days. I want you to bow your hearts with me as we ask the Lord to bless his word. Father God, we love you. And again, what an honor and a privilege, first and foremost, to stand before you, the God of heaven, the God of the universe, the God of the earth, the God of all creation. What an honor and a privilege it is to stand today before your people. Lord, I ask this morning by your Holy Spirit that you would open the scriptures to our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would again help us in these latter days to be discerning believers. Help us, dear God, to be vigilant, dear God. Help us, dear God, to know what's going on, dear God, and be prepared and ready, uh, ready uh, uh, to, uh, to stand in defense of the gospel in these latter days. Now, Lord, we love you and we ask that you bless this word. We ask for an open heaven this morning and we love you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Discerning the last days. And we're going to see some amazing things here. Uh, this is our Bible prophecy chart, which is a chart of time. And uh, we're currently in what's called the church age. And again, I know it may look a little confusing there, but this is a, a great chart that will give you God's order of events. And we're in the church age. The next major event is uh, that of the rapture of the church, where the church will literally be caught up. But today we're going to look at these uh, current signs and events. Discerning the last days. Our generation is greatly unaware of the critical time in which we live. The signs of the times are all around us, but our undiscerning hearts uh, are uh, oblivious to what they are and what they mean. Jesus was very disapproving of the religious groups of his time because they could not discern the signs of the times. It is imperative that we become discerning believers to effectively reach this end time generation. We are living in perilous times and fear is gripping the hearts of much of the world. We, the believers, have the answer that calms their fears. Knowing the times make us, makes us effective and equip ministers to proclaim the hope of the gospel that this generation is looking for. What we have is a sound, clear message that can help a world that is lost. You know, a lot of people in the world today, they are concerned about the end times. Uh, we know that because uh, uh, they go to psychics trying to find out the future. Rather than come to God and get God's word on the future, they go to psychics. People want to know the end times. But it's good that we as believers understand the end times and know where we are, where we are better equipped to help a world that is searching. Now, I'm a topical teacher, so I'm going to give you four topics this morning. We're going to look at um, uh, Jesus reprimands those who could not discern the times. He, he rebuked them in a sense. Then I'm going to define what is a sign or what is signs. Then we're going to look at the signs of the times in Scripture. What I'm going to do there, I'm going to hit signs in the Gospels. I'm going to hit signs in society. We're going to look at the nation of Israel. We're going to cover just a number of things. I'm going to hit some things pretty fast. Some things I'm going to focus in on. But we're going to see where we are today. We're truly living in the last days. And then last, we'll close up with how should the signs of the times affect our days, uh, our daily lives as Christians? And it should affect you in a positive way, which we're going to see uh, as we go forward. So let's define the term. What does it mean to discern? Uh, discern. It means having or showing good judgment, showing insight and understanding, Dis discriminating, able to see and understand people and things or situations clearly and intelligently. I like some of the synonyms for it. It is uh, perceptive, wise, and aware, knowing and informed. In these latter days, we need to be informed about where we are. We need to know what the scriptures say about the end times. You know, there's a lot of falsehood that's out there. There's a lot of abuse that's out there. People are calling things signs of the times, and they're not signs of the, signs of the times. We need to know what the Bible uh, give us as far as prophecy regarding the last days. So in that, Jesus reprimands those who could not discern these times. And what happened during Jesus' day, he, he was met by the, by, the, by the scribes and the Pharisees. And it's the only time these two groups got along because uh, normally they were in two different camps. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 16, verses 1 through 4, uh, they came to Jesus and they challenged him. Uh, regarding the signs. Look at this. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired that he uh, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. 
And he answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Jesus said, O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Jesus told uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees of his day, you men, you prepare your life based on the forecast you see in the sky, but you guys cannot discern the signs of the times. This was an indictment against the church of his day, and it's an indictment against us today as well. Many people today, they watch the weather news, I mean the weatherman, uh, and, and again, they prepare their lives based on the weatherman's prophecy. Jesus rebuked these men. He called them hypocrites. Not on that, but Jesus went on, to, he went on to say this to them. He says, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, uh, but the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. Jesus told these Pharisees, he said, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now, we know what happened to Jonah. The Bible said that Jonah, God prepared a fish for him, and Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights until God vomited him up, uh, vomited him out of that uh, fish, and jo uh, uh, Jonah went a, days, a three days journey in one day to do God's will. Now, the reason why Jesus said the sign of Jonah, because Jesus tied the sign of Jonah to his resurrection. You know, when Jonah uh, was, was thrown up out of this fish, it was like a type of a resurrection. And Jesus said, fellas, the only sign I'm going to give you, this, uh, this adulterous generation, the only sign I'm going to give you is, the is, is my resurrection. He said, when you see my resurrection, but again, these Pharisees, they wouldn't believe in the resurrection either. But I thank God that God, he so beautifully has given us signs and indicators, which we're going to see uh, uh, in a few minutes. Now, what is a sign? What is a sign? Look at this picture. What is a sign? Isn't that something? Signs. Signs give direction. Signs prepare us. What is a sign? Uh, a sign is a marker in time. As you see a sign, you prepare yourself. It may say yield. You slow down. As it says, you know, there's a, there's a crook in the road. You slow down and you prepare yourself to make that, make that, make that, make that move. What is a sign? It's an indication of a coming event. Well, Jesus has given us signs all through the scriptures of a coming event. All of these signs, all of these indicators I'm going to give you this morning, all of these signs, they point to the second coming of Jesus, not the rapture, but the second coming. The second coming takes place after the tribulation period. And these signs that we're going to look at, they point to the second coming. And it tells me this, if we're seeing signs today that point to the second coming, then how close is the rapture? The rapture is even closer. So as we're going to see, we're living in an urgent time now. And again, God want to use us in these latter days to reach a dying world. I love this quote here from Chuck Mistler from his book, Prophecy 2020. Listen to what he says about, about these signs and indicators. He said, the Bible lays out a detailed scenario of the final climax for mankind on planet Earth. It also provides, listen to this, testable reference points to determine just where we are in that scenario. I love that. The signs of the times, these indicators, they are testable reference points where you can know where you are in that scenario. Because we see these markers in time, there are certain things that God have told us that would be end time events. These are markers in time. As you see these markers, you know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're living in the end times. And I can tell you today, saints, we are living in the end times. This is not the hour to play church. This is not the hour to, to live a backslidden life. Listen, we're, we're living in the end times. So let's look at the signs. We're going to see the signs in Scripture. We're going to see these signs of the time in Scripture. And again, we're going to see some amazing things. Here. But before I do that, uh, what I want to do here, I want to show you uh, this, this little clock is going to come up here. Uh, this is a clock. It's called the Doomsday Clock. It's put out by a group called the Bullet, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, this is a group of Nobel laureates. Brilliant men, smart, smarty pants. These guys are brilliant. They're a little bit too brilliant for their own, for their own sake. But they're smart men. 
And what they've done, they've created a doomsday clock. And what they do, they move this clock either backwards or forward, depending on world events that they are discerning. So let me show you something. Look at this. In 1995, the clock was 14 minutes to the end of the world. 1998, they moved the clock to nine minutes to the end of the world. In 2002, they moved it to seven minutes before doomsday. 2010, they moved it six minutes till the end of the world. 2012, they moved it five minutes. We're five minutes away from doomsday. 2015, they moved it to three minutes to doomsday. And last year, they made the unprecedented step and they moved the clock two and a half minutes to the, to the end of the world. Look at this picture that's coming in the screen. Uh, this, this, is pure, this, this is two of the scientists here that's part of the group. And they moved the clock two and a half minutes to midnight. You know what these men are doing? These men are discerning the times this is what we should be doing in the church. Only problem, though, these men don't have hope. They believe we're two minutes away from the end of the world. And you know something? We understand based on Scripture, you know, this is not the end of the world yet. I mean, God, uh, for, for the righteous, God has a beautiful, uh, a beautiful plan. I mean, our uh, end of the story will be a blessed event. You know, it won't be doom and gloom for the righteous. Man, our future is going to be beautiful with God. But these guys have no hope. But, but what hit me about this group is that these are men who are discerning the times. I meet many Christians say, you know, uh, I don't like Bible prophecy. I don't like no end time messages because it's all doom and gloom, you know. Uh, you know, I hear the preacher, the prophecy guy coming. I'm not coming to church because he's going to scare me. No, I'm not going to scare you, but I'm going to give you the word of God. And what we're going to see, we're going to see what the word of God has to say about the end times. Uh, these end time messages should not, should not scare you. It should motivate you. It should, it, should, it should challenge you to allow God to work in your life. So we're going to see that as we go forward. Now, Jesus gave, uh, gives the signs of the times. And what I'm going to do here, uh, these signs are in the gospel, so I'm going to hit them. Some of them, I'm going to hit some of them pretty fast. But uh, here in the gospel of Matthew chapter 24, verse 5 and 11, chapter uh, Mark, Mark chapter 13, verse 6 and uh, 21 through 23, Luke 21, verse 8, Jesus told his disciples in the latter days that there would be false Christ who would come on the scene. These are men who would claim to be the anointed one. And I got just some examples here of some false Christ in our recent past. Uh, every one of these guys here are dead, so they can't be the Christ. Uh, David Koresh, Jim Jones, De Jesus Miranda, and Sun Young Moon. Sun Young Moon said, he said, Jesus failed to do what God called him to do, so therefore God raised him and his wife up to be the, the, be the new Christ. Problem, he died. Look at this next one here. In the screen here, this is a false Christ in the media. I think this is the most diabolical of all false Christ in that uh, they are redefining Christ. I've challenged Christians in the latter days, you better know Jesus from the scriptures. Every holiday, Christmas and, uh, and Easter, these periodicals have a cover story on your Christ, your Lord, but they, but they give you a false view of him. This is the most diabolical false Christ. Jesus is under attack. You never see a cover story on Allah or Mohammed. It's always Jesus. But Jesus said false Christ. This is an indicator of the last days. Jesus said in the latter days that there will be wars and rumors of wars. Look at this, Matthew 24, verse 6, and Mark 13, verse 7, Luke 21, verse 9. You know, there are over 40 wars that are going on right now. We don't hear all of them in the news, but wars are going on all over the world. It's a sign. It's an indicator of a sick world in need of a savior. Well, in looking at that, we have Kim Jong-un. He's 34 years old. I call him the baby with nukes. Kim Jong-un in the headline. Listen, listen, listen at the threat and the warning he gives to us. This is Kim Jong-un. He said this. Kim Jong-un threatens to, to ramp up North Korea's nuclear arsenal uh, uh, in, uh, in World War III warning. He's warning us. See, that's a rumor of war. Look at this. Kim Jong-un says North Korea uh, poses substantial nuclear threat to the U.S. Look at this. Kim Jong-un issues a threat to America in his New Year's message. This guy has a problem. 
Look at this. New York Times talked about him, quoting him. This is November 28th of last year. North Korea said Wednesday that it had successfully tested, tested the Wasong 15, a newly developed ICBM uh, that it said could deliver heavy nuclear warheads anywhere in the continental United States. The missile flew higher and for longer duration than previous, previous in, uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile launches, which flew for 37 minutes on, on July 4th and for 47 minutes on July 8th. David Wright, a scientist of the Union of Concerned Scientists, said the missile performed better than two fired in July and exhibited a potential range of more than 8,000 miles able to reach Washington or any other part of the continental U.S. This is wars and rumors of wars. Let me tell you, we're, we're living in the last day. We're living in a, in a world that needs Jesus. This is, this is the end time. Now look at this one. This one here. This one really amazes me. Uh, I call this the rise of the Gog and Magog coalition. Here, here we have uh, Iran, Russia, and Turkey. And again, this is just amazing. Ezekiel 38, 39 talks about uh, uh, God's going to, he's going to judge Gog and Magog. Uh, Ezekiel 38 gives a list of nations that's going to form an alliance with Russia in the end times to come against the nation of Israel. Now, what we're seeing here is an, is an amazing event. This happened uh, November of last year. You have, uh, you have the, uh, the Iranian uh, president, uh, Rouhani, let me go back, uh, the uh, Iranian pr uh, president, Rouhani, let me bring it back into the screen. Technology is good when it works, saints. I'm going to get it there. All right, here we go. Uh, you, you, have, you have Rouhani, the, uh, the Iranian president. You have Putin, the Russian president. And then you have uh, 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 Erdogan. And this man, he's the Turkey president. But this is an amazing event because now you have uh, three of the players for the Gog and Magog war have now come, come together. These were, these were arch enemies. As a matter of fact, two years ago, uh, Erdogan, the Turkish president, shot down a Russian plane that veered into uh, Turkish airspace. Two years later, they're buddies. Here's another, another amazing thing. Here you have the Sunni and the Shia. The Sunni and the Shia, that hatred is even worse than their hatred for Israel. But now you have a Sunni and a Shia coming together in the last days. Let me tell you something, I'm saying. we're living some amazing time. Uh, it's like God is moving major chess pieces on his prophetic chessboard to bring us to a close. This is amazing. Wars and rumors of wars, things that are setting up for the end times. Jesus also talked about in the latter days that there would be deception, all types of deception, that men would be deceived. Matthew 24, verse 5 and 11, Mark 13, verse 7. Deception is running rapid in our world. Case in point, I mentioned uh, last year uh, had, this, had this crazy prediction that the rapture was going to take place September 23rd. I was so shocked by the number of Christians that bought into that lie. A guy talked to me, he said, Brother Perkins, are you sure? Are you sure it's not going to happen? I said, the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. You know, if some people just simply believe the scriptures. It will save you a lot of heartache and a lot of embarrassment. You know, September 24th came, and guess what? The word of God was vindicated once again. But people today are being deceived. Let me tell you some saints, you must stick with the authority of the word. Judge everything you hear. Judge every prophecy by what you read in Scripture. Let the word of God be the final, uh, uh, final decision-making maker for you in regards to end-time prophecy. Jesus talked about in the latter days that there will be famine. Matthew 24, verse 7. Mark 13, verse 8. Luke 21, verse 11. They're using terms like mega famines. I mentioned before, how in the world do we have famine in such a technological society as we have? Not only do we have technology, but we have equipment to place food anywhere in the world. Why do we still have famines? You know why? Because Jesus said in the latter days, famine would be a part of the end time generation. This is a sign of the time. You watch commercials and you see these little babies you know, with swollen stomachs. stomachs. You know, we support them, we do, but that's a sign that Jesus is coming back. It's a sign of the end times. Famine in the 21st century. Amazing. Look at this next one, pestilence. Here, Jesus talked about Matthew 24, 7, Luke 21, 11. He said in the latter days that there would be pestilence. Pestilence are diseases, incurable diseases, 
all types of things coming into our culture and our, and, and our society. How many remember SARS? Remember SARS, everybody, everybody wearing masks? Uh, the, blue, uh, the bird flu, swine flu, the Zika virus, and the list goes on. Not only that, but we have, we have childhood diseases that they thought they once cured that are now coming back on the scene with a vengeance. It's letting us know we have a sick world and again, Jesus said, this will be an indicator of my return. This is an indicator that I'm coming back. He talked about earthquakes in diverse places or many places. Matthew 24, 7, Mark 13, 8, Luke 21, 11. He said earthquakes in many places are diverse places. They're having earthquakes today, saints, where they've never had them before. Not only that, but they're having earthquakes of large magnitude. You know what it's telling me? That the world... Is groaning. The Bible says the world is groaning and driven. You know, the world is tired of sin. And I really believe that the, the shaking of the world is a direct result of sin. The world is tired. But Jesus said this would be a sign in the last days. Look at this next one. This is an amazing one here. This one here. Jesus said in the gospel of Luke chapter 21 and 11 that there would be fearful, fearful sights and great signs in the heavens. Things that man cannot explain in the heavens. I like this one. This is a picture taken by the Hubble satellite. It's called the Helix Nebula. Nebula. Uh, uh, people have coined the name the Eye of God. Uh, this picture looks like an eye. Uh, uh, the scientists don't like it being called the Eye of God. You know, uh, this is gases and stars and things that have formed this. But you know something? God is up to something. I made the statement, you know, scientists looking into those telescopes, looking up at heaven, and God looking down through the telescope. I believe that. The Bible said, fearful sights in the heavens. Man can't explain what God is doing. God is messing with him. The guy looked at him and go, ooh, that's like an eye. Can you imagine how he felt when he saw that? <laughs> God messing with him. Look at this one. Luke, uh, no, uh, uh, here, here, here in the gospel, Matthew 24, Jesus said in the latter days that the love of many would wax cold. We have a society now that don't love like they used to. Look at this. Elder abuse, shaming, bullying. You know, back in the day, you didn't have a lot of this back in the day. Uh, look at this picture. The lady in the bottom of her head says, beaten by her grandson. You know, back in the day, you didn't have that. Back in the day, you didn't beat grandma. Grandma say, what? <laughs> grandma pull out that big old skillet, man. Boom. You start seeing birds flying, man. No, no, see, we're in the end times now. We're in a culture now that have empowered the child to disobey. That's a sign of the last days. We have a culture now that don't love, people don't have genuine care anymore. Even the caregivers are abusers. This is a sign of a sick world. This is a world that needs Jesus. Now, I love this sign. This is one of those positive. I like this. Jesus said that the gospel would be, would be preached and published, Matthew 24, 14, and Mark 13, 10. He said the gospel would be published and preached, and then the end shall come with the rise of technology. Technology has caused the gospel to go to the ends of the world, the nook and crannies of the world. I really believe the internet, God allowed it to come to fruition because it was going to help the gospel go behind the bamboo curtain, the iron curtain, and whatever other curtain that's hiding the gospel from his people. You know the gospel is going behind North Korea? You know the gospel is going into Russia and China? Yeah, the gospel, because of technology, this is a sign of the end times. Even the Apostle Paul gave us prophetic uh, uh, texts. He outlined signs in society. He called them perilous times. Perilous times mean uh, times of trouble or troublesome times. Look at this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Paul gave a list. He said, in the latter days, there would be a generation of selfish people. Men are lovers of self more than lovers of God. Men that are heady and high-minded. The Bible says here, men uh, without natural affection. He talked about children that are disobedient. He goes through the list. He talking about men. He talked about men ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, men have knowledge, but they're not getting God's knowledge in the last days. This is perilous times. This is a sign. This is an indicator that we're living in the end times. And God wants us as Christians to discern. See, what I'm giving you now is things that you need to know. You need to have these signs marked in your Bible. 
Uh, we have a manual out there. It's called Bible Prophecy, God's Order of Events. We have a whole section on the signs of the times. In that section, I have one whole section called uh, a, a quick list of the signs. And we give you all the signs. We show you signs as like a bullet. You can get these scriptures and get them, get them marked in your Bible so you have them ready. I love them because as I'm flying, you know, I'm preaching on the planes. And I love getting those people, boy, they got questions, man. They want to know what's going on. I say, you know, the Bible talk about these times, especially when you got turbulence, man. I love, I love preaching with turbulence. I mean, they, their hands are gripped on the seats, turning red, but they're listening. Because they think, they think they're about to check out of here, you know what I mean? I love preaching to God. Listen, listen, saints, we need to know what the Bible says about the end times. The Bible, the Bible commands us in Peter to have an answer for every man that asks us a reason of the hope of Jesus that is in us. You need to know the signs for your family. You need to know the signs of the times for your coworkers so you can better tell them where we are and what's happening. We're living in some amazing times. Paul even talked about doctrines of devils. Look at this. First Timothy chapter four, verse number one. Paul said, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of, of devils. In the last day, Paul said men would give heed. They would begin to listen to things that are demonic. They're listening. They, they, they're giving heed. They're giving heed to spirits and doctrines or teachings of devils. Let's go a little forward. Look at this. Here's a major sign. We know this Israel, the nation of Israel in the last days. I love this. I love this Israel. A major sign. The book of Amos, chapter 9, verses 13 through 15 here. Amos talked about in the latter days that God was going to bring Israel back into world history. Ezekiel 38, verses 8 through 11, God said that he was going to multiply Jew upon the land. Listen, when Israel became a nation in the latter days, it was a major sign of the time. You know, Israel is on the news every day. Yes, yeah, a sign of the time. Look at this, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. This is a prophecy. I'm going to talk about it a little bit further here. This is it's called, it's called uh, Jerusalem, a burdensome stone. Jerusalem, in the latter days, will be hated by all nations. This is a sign of the end times. And again, I'm going to show you some things now. Now, one thing I like about this, though, is that what God did, God knew that he was going to bring Israel back into world history. And God has given such a prophecy that he tied the nation of Israel to the universe. Look at this. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 and 36. It says, thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for light and day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves there, thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Those, uh, if those ordinances depart from before me, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. God tied the nation of Israel to the universe. He said, if you can, if you can stop the ordinances of the sun, moon, and stars, Israel will not be a nation forever. I woke up this morning saying, Is, I mean, the, new, I mean the, uh, the sun was up. It tells me that Israel is here by divine providence. This nation... The things that are going on there is so amazing. It's amazing what we're seeing in the end times. We're in the end times, saints. Now, Dr. Dave Reagan from his book called The Jewish People Rejected Our Beloved, he made this statement about the scripture I just read. He said, what God is saying here is that the nation of Israel will exist as long as the sun comes up and goes down and the seasons uh, of the year come and go. And then to emphasize his point, the Lord states that the nation of Israel will continue to exist until all heavens above and the foundations of the earth have been explored and measured. In other words, Israel is here to stay. Let me tell you something, saints. The fact that Israel has come back in the world history, this little bitty nation is a major sign that God's word is true and we're living in the end times. As things are set up, as things are happening in that land, I track it all the time because it lets us know that it's getting closer and it's getting closer. Whether you believe it, whether you understand all the nuances of prophecy, it, it, it's irrelevant. Prophecy is coming to pass. We're in the last days. Look at this. Jerusalem, 
a cup of trembling. I want to read the text for you here. This is amazing. Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3. God says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. This prophecy said there's coming a day where all the people of the earth will be against the nation of Israel, against Jerusalem. You know, people say, you know, if we can only stabilize the Middle East, if we can just stabilize it, we get the Jew and the Palestinian together, the world will be at peace. No, it won't. You know why? Because this prophecy tells us here that the unstableness of the region is by God's design. This is a prophecy. The unstable cup is like a cup of coffee that's shaking. You can't drink it because it's, it's, it's unstable. Jerusalem in the latter days is an unstable place. Israel is unstable by God's design. No president, no prime minister, the UN, no one can stabilize that region outside of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So in light of that, I want to show you some signs of the times event. Our president, I thank God for Donald Trump. Uh, he, 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 uh, he, he, has, uh, he has promised, I thank God for him, he has promised to move uh, our U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, which I think, you know, we should have done anyway. I mean, uh, it, it happened. Uh, I say it happened. It, it happened on the books. In, uh, in other words, uh, uh, there's an act called the Jerusalem Embassy Act that was signed back in 1995. Back in 1995, we should have moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem back then. But every president up to Donald Trump has kicked the can down the road every six months. Every six months, they have delayed moving, moving this thing because of political, uh, uh, you know, theater. Donald Trump, thank God for him, he's the first president to, to do this. So in light of that, look what happened. Look what he said. Donald Trump, President Trump said this. He said, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The president openly and unequivocally. He said, the president described his decision as being in America's best interest, while emphasizing that this move would move the region closer to a lasting peace agreement. He said, we cannot, we cannot solve uh, our problems by making the same failed assumptions and repeating the same failed strategies of the past. The president said, all challenges demand new approaches. Listen to this. My announcement today marks the beginning of a new approach to conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, I love my president. We are commanded to pray for him, whether you voted for him or not, whether you like him or not, you are commanded to pray for him. The Bible says, pray for those in authority that you might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Who's ever in office, you're commanded to pray for them. Well, I love my president, but I gotta tell you something, President Trump, our president cannot bring peace to the region. That is only reserved for Jesus and Jesus only. I'm glad he's moving the embassy, though. I'm going to show you what's going to happen. Look at this. Look at this perspective. We're going to see a perspective here. Now, now this, this perspective here, uh, I'm going to show you, come back to it. This perspective is a perspective of the Jew and the Palestinians. So how both of these groups look at President Trump's decision. It's amazing. So let's look at the Palestinians' view. Abbas threatens war if Trump doesn't rescind Jerusalem declaration. Look at this. He said, Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas on Tuesday continued to exaggerate, continued his exaggerated response to the U.S. President Donald Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by threatening a regional war. Look at this. Speaking in Cairo, Abbas said Jerusalem is the key to peace if it is our capital, and if it is not, it is the key to war. Trump will need to choose. Isn't that something? He said Trump got to choose, either going to be peace or it's going to be war. He said there is no such thing as a Palestinian who will give up even one millimeter of Jerusalem. Let me tell you something. President Trump's decision is going to further tighten the region. 
It's going to further make the cup unstable, but it's by God's design. So I'm telling you, it's, it's signs of the time stuff. You know, it's in, it's in time stuff. You hear me? Now, let's look at the Israel's perspective. This is from the Breaking Israel News. They said, President Trump's epic proclamation on Wednesday, acknowledging Jerusalem as the, as the eternal capital of the Jewish people, was a major step toward establishing, listen to this, the third temple and bringing the Messianic era. So to the Jew, they said, when President Trump declared Jerusalem the capital, it's a sign for the third temple, said a number of Jewish activists working to rebuild the holy temple. What he did last night was an enormous step in bringing the temple. Uh, As said uh, Fry, he said, uh, official spokesman for the uh, Unity Temple Movement, an organization of of, uh, uh, an association of organizations working toward making the third temple a reality, told Breaking Israel News, he added, uh, uh, this necessarily had to come from a non-Jew in order to bring them into the process so they will be able to take their part in the temple. This is amazing. He said Donald Trump's declaration is a sign for the third temple. Let me tell you something. It's amazing what's happening. We're, this stuff is moving so fast, man, it's almost hard to keep up with it. I challenge backsliders today. Listen, this is not the hour to be living a backslidden Christian life. Too much is happening. These indicators, God is giving you warnings. There there are indicators that are happening before you today. Now, what should discerning the last days or how should discerning the last days affect our daily life? How should it affect us? As a Christian, how should you interpret the signs of the time? Should should these signs make you become a hermit or or, or, or an extreme prepper? Listen, nothing wrong with prepping. In Southern California, we we should have water and food in case something happens. But there are a lot of people that are extreme preppers today, and they've gone into a false balance with it. A lot of Christians are going into extreme prepping. As a matter of fact, some Christians right now still have Y2K food in their garage. (laughs) Let me tell you something. Bible prophecy should never produce a fear in you that it immobilizes you or it makes you uh, static or, or, or it stops you. I had some Christian friends come to our conference and say, Brother Perkins, we really appreciate the words you give. We were Christians that were extreme. We were extreme preppers. And what happened? We stayed in our house. We were so scared we would never go outside. That's not, that's not Bible prophecy. What should, what should these type of messages do for the Christian? Well, look what Jesus said. This is amazing. How should these messages affect you? Luke 21, verse 28 Jesus said, and when these things begin to come to pass, when you begin to see the signs that I've given you, Jesus said, then look up and lift up your head. That's a positive sign, saints. Jesus said, when you see the signs, he said, look up and lift up your heads. Why? He said, for your redemption draweth near. Saints, it's getting close. I love the signs of the times because let me know that Jesus is coming soon. I'm going to see my Savior pretty soon, y'all. I'm excited. Now, listen, it don't mean I'm so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. No, no. People say, man, you, you prophecy guys, man, you, boy, you guys are spacey. You guys live in the future. No, no. I'm, because I understand the future, I'm, I'm a more productive citizen. You know, I'm a good person to be around because I understand the end of the story. I got hope. I'm a happy guy. Let me tell you something, saints. I live in the same world you do. Uh, I, get, I received the same threats from, from, from the Iranians, same threats from Kim Jong-un, same threats. But guess what? I sleep so good every night. Man, I hit that bed, man. Pew, la, la, land. I'm not stressing out by any signs, indicators. I teach this. You know why? Because God is in control. Look, I'm looking up, I'm lifting up. You know something? These signs motivate me to become an evangelist to reach a lost world. These signs cause me to go after my loved ones who are not saved. You have loved ones that are not saved, don't you? Let these signs motivate you to go after them. Mom, Dad, listen, time is why. Let me show you how close it is. You better get your life right, Mom. Better get your life right, Dad, sister, brother, husband. Come on, man, get your life right. Look at this, Romans 13. Verse 11 through 14, Paul wrote, and that knowing the time, 
that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Listen, the signs of the time should motivate you to come out of your lethargicness, come out of your coldness. Wake up out of sleep, Christian, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness. These signs should motivate you to cast off sin in your life. Backslider, come on back to the Lord today. Don't play with God. Come on back. Come on back. Look at this. He said, let us put on the armor of light. The Bible said you are children of the day. We're children of the day. Let us walk earnestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. See these signs of the time, end time message, it should motivate you to live a holy life. It should motivate you to, to shore up your Christian borders, not live loose. I call it greasy grace and sloppy agape. You got a lot of Christians, greasy grace, man. They, they live greasy, man. They just, look, I'm, I'm covered by grace, man, and they live like the devil. Don't be deceived. You know what the Bible says about the grace of God? The Bible says the grace of God will teach you to live a godly life. It will teach you to deny ungodliness in this present evil world. See, some people are taking grace and they make grace sloppy, and they do everything that's outside of what God has prescribed in Scripture. No, grace will keep you holy. Yeah, I'm almost done. Look at this. Matthew chapter 24 again. Jesus talking about the wars and rumors of wars. He said, Christians, don't let, don't, don't let that shake your world. Look at this. He says, and when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, Kim Jong-un's threats, rumors, when you hear of this, he says, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Jesus said, Christian, don't you, don't you get upset. Don't, listen, let it motivate you in a positive light and not in a negative. I mean, a lot of people say, you know something, I don't watch the news because the news is negative. I say, you're watching it wrong. You need to watch it with a prophetic eye. If you look at it from a prophetic perspective, you realize that time is winding up and I must be about my father's business. Saints, we're living in the end times. This is not the hour to play. Here's our response to Israel. See, we should not get involved in trying to make peace in the region. This is what God requires that we do as a church for Israel. Psalm uh, 122, 6, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. All God requires the church to do for Israel is to pray for the peace. When you pray for the peace of Israel, you're praying for the millennial reign of Christ. You're praying for the millennium. The Bible says, Isaiah 9, 6, that Jesus will sit on the throne of his father, David. He will govern the world with peace, the prince of peace. That's the only time Jerusalem will have a lasting peace, when Jesus, the prince of peace, sits on the throne. And God will give that glory to no man but his son, Jesus. The ultimate peace in the Middle East is coming, but you would be surprised as to how it would come. The United Nations and other governing entities believe they can accomplish this great task, but they are extremely mistaken. God has so beautifully given in Scripture how peace will be achieved in the Middle East. It is through his son, Jesus Christ, and, and, and only him. God reveals his plan in such clear detail that no one can, uh, I mean, uh, with clear detail that anyone can see it. The unstableness of Jerusalem is by God's design. He controls the affairs of the world, and in his time, it will have divine peace, as he has described in his word. See, our part is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Here's my last verse as I close. Psalm 119.6 says this. I love this. It says, great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. Listen, saints, we need a relationship with the word. You need to love the word of God in the latter days. Listen, listen, you need the word of God more than just Sunday morning and Wednesday night. You know, a lot of times we, we come to church Sunday morning and hear the word, and then we get in our car and we throw our Bible in the back window. I drive behind a lot of cars with the Bible in the back window, burning up in the sun. They don't pull it out until Wednesday service. You better get that Bible out that, out that sun. 
Take that Bible in your house and read the notes that you learn in Sunday service. Let me tell you some, Chris, you better get this word in you. You have a world that is attacking what you believe. The Bible says, you want great peace? Love the word of God. Saints, we're living in the end times. And again, we are living in some amazing time. God want to use all of us in these latter days.